Hi, hi everybody. Um, hi, I'm Diane Davis. I'm the chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design, and I'm going to get us started because we are actually, this event is going to go till 1.30 and not 2, and I don't want to take away too much time um, from us, co this collective group, to be able to have the great pleasure to listen to Richard Sennett speak to us today about, possibly about his new book, but also a series of projects that he's been working um, on for a while. The title of his lecture is called The Open City, and we'll hear more about that in a second. Um, again, I don't want to take up too much time to, well, actually, I could not possibly begin to kind of reiterate everything that you need to know about Richard Sennett, his bio, the number of awards that he's had, the, the kind of esteem that he's held in in many different disciplines related to design, sociology, history, you name it, he's kind of one of the leading intellectual voices of contemporary, I can't even say American uh, academia, but also globally working now in, in and living in London part of his time. I do want to say that he's a professor at both, um, a professor of the humanities at NYU, as well as a professor of sociology at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and the chair of Theatra Mundi, an, an organization we might actually hear a little more about, has been a, a visiting, distinguished visitor and recipient of awards at multiple major universities around the world, including Cambridge University, um, universities in Germany, Italy, etc. But the other thing that I wanted to mention a little bit about Richard Sennett's extraordinarily deep and important published work. If you take a look at his CV and the number, he's basically published a book like every other year from maybe 1970 or something like that. He, on a personal note, I want to mention that when I was in college in Chicago, I remember reading one of his first books, it was not the first one, Families Against the City, an amazing book about kind of migration, culture, um, equity, inequality, and a kind of collective consciousness that uh, blew my mind as an urban sociology major, probably had something to do with continuing to study sociology myself and has written a series of major books that you all have heard about, The Uses of Disorder, The Fall of Public Man, a book on authority, Flesh and Stone, The Body and the City in Western Civilization, The Conscience of the Eye, and these, this last two are really oriented towards the design professions in ways that maybe the earlier books were oriented towards his, historical urban sociology. Um, a book called Respect in a World of Inequality, the Culture of New Capitalism. I'm going to ask you about capitalism later, actually, because that's kind of dropped out. It come, it's come and gone in your ove. Um, more, more recently, in 2008, The Craftsman, which also a really well-received book. And, and recently, in 2012, Yale University Press, Together, colon, The Rituals, Pleasures, and Politics of Cooperation. I'm wondering whether in that you know, especially that last issue of a kind of how people work together or live together um, is a theme that has gone way back to Families Against the City. It's threaded through most of your work, and I think it's going to be part of what you're talking about in your lecture on the open city. So without further ado, might I, I'm so pleased to introduce Richard Sennett. Um, thank you. <laughs> you know that I've, um, I was a student here. I was an architectural dropout, and so I went into arts and sciences because I couldn't hack architecture. But I've taught here uh, off and on all, all my life, and um, I'm teaching elements now. And it's really, really such a pleasure for me. This is really home for me the GSD, so I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, what I thought I would do today is describe to you uh, some ideas that oriented uh, me and others who have worked on a project for the UN called Habitat. Habitat uh, is 
uh, a project of UN Habitat, UNESCO, and please do not ask me why the Americans have dropped out of UNESCO. I'm so sick about talking about this. UN Habitat, UNESCO, the World Bank, and um, the IMF. And it takes a look at the state of the global environment once every 20 years. Now, I'm so old that I attended the first of these in 1976. And this is, was my third Habitat meeting, and I, I was one of the chairs of it. I don't think I'll make it to Habitat 4, but um, I want to describe to you what we were trying to do. Basically, the, in the intellectual part of Habitat, which concluded um, a year ago in Quito, and whose scientific papers, as academic papers, are published next week by Elsevier, a huge pile of these papers. What we were trying to do is put together an idea of planning and an idea of design. That was, it was a very GSD-like project. But we were trying to do this in a context where more and more, uh, particularly in the developing world, uh, they're separated to the detriment of both. So I'm going to just talk a little about what, how we um, tried to see the physical and the social parts of the city together. Uh, I, I haven't talked about this before, so you tell me if it doesn't, if something is, doesn't resonate, you tell me. Um, but the idea about this is to, to understand what a city should be in its physical and its socioeconomic and political economy. How do you put those two together? In my own view, what a city should be is a place which enriches experience. And that means practically uh, a question of opening up our opportunities uh, economically, but socially it means, and psychologically, it means managing complexity. Uh, that an open city is one in which people become, uh, thanks to the way the city operates and the way it's designed, becomes a place in which people are more and more skilled in managing complex conditions of life and taking uh, advantage of opportunities which are unforeseen, accidental, etc. Now, I would say that cities today are not enabling either. They're becoming particularly in under the aegis of global capitalism. They're becoming ever more rigid, crude, and closed. Um, Jakob Burkhardt, the 19th century historian, talked about uh, the, uh, the age of brutal simplifiers. He meant nationalism. He looked forward to um, Trump. But I think in uh, urbanism today, we're in a different way under the shadow of this age of brutal, brutal simpl uh, simplifiers. And in um, Habitat 3, I and my group, uh, which is uh, Ricky Burdett and Saskia Sassen, asked what we might do to open the city physically up so that people's experience in it could be more complex and their ability to manage difficulty and complexity could expand. And before I go on to describe this, I want to thank Clay, who was our, one of our researchers on this project. The UN is not, I must say, a very uh, um, efficient organization, and Clay managed to deal with our inefficiencies beautifully. Um, 
One thing we try to do in looking at this concept of the open city was to take it um, as a kind of, not so much as a kind of uh, planning instrument, but as a set of propositions that people would bounce off of and react to either positively or negatively. But it's an idea that tries to see the city whole. So let me start by saying, what does complexity mean? For Aristotle, it meant synoikismos, that is, a coming together of oikai, which are like extended family groups. And he, famously, you may know, that he wrote in the politics that a city cannot come into being by people who are the same. It has to come into being by people the gathering together, the synergy of people who are different, these different oikai. Uh, practically, that uh, meant in terms of combining people um, to, uh, for the sake of defense or for the, uh, uh, for the sake of trade. But it also means something politically, which is people learning how to account, points of view unlike uh, one's own, that is to acquire the skills to deal with people unlike oneself. So this notion of synoikismos contains in it an idea that there is a kind of craft required to be able to identify, understand, combat, but, and work with people who are different than oneself. It's a fundamental, it seems to me, principle of urban, urbanism uh, ethically. When we started out, confronted by masses of, of planning statistics about growth patterns in uh, uh, various parts of, uh, of uh, Central Africa and Southeast Asia, we looked at this large body of reports and so on. And Saskia Sassen said, let's just junk it for the moment. And let's ask ourselves what it means ethically for a person to develop the skill for dealing with people with, to practice signoikismos. Uh, somewhat. Um, the UN officials became, uh, they blanched a bit, but we did it. And here is how my own take on how this works. The ethical framework for dealing with people who are unlike oneself is exemplified in a classic conflict between two Jewish theologians, Martin Buber and Emmanuel Levinas. For Buber, as those of you, whether you're Jewish or not, may know, the idea of the relationship, ethical relationship between people is expressed as an I-thou relationship. That is, that the more uh, that you know about somebody else or interact with them, the more intimately, the more intimate and closer you come to them. It's, it's hard to render in English, but it's the difference between you and thou. You is, is impersonal, thou is a, a more personal, sie und du in, in uh, German and so on. Um, the idea for Buber, therefore, was that if you mix people together, the more they interact, the more they'll understand each other. Whereas for Levinas, the important thing was the dash that separates I and thou. That is to say that there is an unbridgeable difference between people um, when they come together. Uh, they don't integrate, they don't unite, they don't form a community. Instead, they become neighbors to each other. And the concept of neighbor for Levinas is somebody who is aware of another intensely, 
but is separated by that dash from ever um, fully becoming uh, one with them. And this to me, and you'll see in this mass of statistical reports, is a kind of insight that we've tried to apply the notion of this Levinasian notion of the neighbor to um, the uh, to the urban condition. It requires skill to be intensely aware of somebody else, to interact with them, and yet not to try and ab uh, abolish the boundaries between self and other. It's a particularly urban concept because the Levinasian version of the neighbor is something that allows strangers to remain stranger in some sense to each other, which doesn't suppose that local community is ultimately the ethical foundation of, um, of a city, its moral foundation, that people can remain apart and yet mutually aware and interactive. So it's, it is a peculiarly, this notion of the neighbor is peculiarly <coughs> urban condition. Um, So the question was, it, it's a skill. It's not just a matter of a good heart. It's a skill in dealing with that hyphen. And the question for us was, how do we translate this into the everyday experience of people in cities? Um, I took a step long ago in my own mind towards answering this question when I worked at MIT. You know that place that's down the river? Um, um, I, I taught planning there for a while, and my office was um, next to the media lab. And a lot of the people, in, this is in the 90s, in the media lab at that time were interested in open systems theory. And um, for me, I began to fill in this kind of ethical vision early in my own thinking by thinking about the city as an open system, that the more open it is, the more this peculiar urban condition of neighborliness can, can develop. What do we mean by an open system? What I remember from that time is the, the immediate lab was you know, filled with, with people you know, reinventing the world. Um, they made a contrast between open and closed via um, a, a, a contrast between um, Microsoft, which was a donor to the Media Lab, and themselves. They thought of a Microsoft experiment as closed and a Media Lab experiment as open. What does this mean? First of all, it meant exploration open versus hypothesis testing, which is closed. Second, it meant a nonlinear process of research, like as in a rolling experiment, versus a predictable path of outcomes. It's the difference in mathematical terms between Boolean logic, which is yes-no logic, uh, and um, and Bayesian logic, which is more open, in which the word maybe, or it's probable but not certain, uh, comes in. That uh, um, introduces an element of non-linearity. And finally, it introduced the notion of, what they were very proud of, of the ability to fail and to learn from failure, whereas the economics of a closed system are such that failure is not an option, right? That you always have to produce a, a result, right? Rather than abort a problem. Um, all of these, as I saw from, from the work that, that these, these Media Lab people were doing, 
had a kind of ethical dimension, which many of them didn't know about, uh, because they were celebrating the open, openness to the unknown. They were celebrating the other in Levinasian terms, rather than familiar interactions with which people became more and more familiar. So I began to think then, how would a city model itself on this kind of an open system? And that's, um, as I said, this was long before. I worked for the UN. Well, I worked for the UN for 40 years, off and on. But I sort of didn't put this together with the planning work I was doing for the UN at the time, uh, but I began to think, even before the practical things which I'm going to show you, that the translation of an open system into a city has three aspects. First, that socially an open city is dialogical, that economically an open city is synchronous, and that politically an open city is always to the left of its nation state. And I'd like to explain, these have been come guiding principles for me in thinking about the city as open, and I'd like to explain them. The term dialogical, as you probably know, um, uh, is derived from Mikhail Bakhtin, uh, the literary critic, but also social critic, put to death by Stalin in the 1930s. It focuses on the process of exchange and the unlikely processes of exchange, first of all in literature, but secondly in ordinary language communication. Rather than looking at discourse as a means to the end of taking a decision. So it's fundamentally, I don't know if any of you study decision-making theory, it's fundamentally hostile to the notion that discourse is a means to an end which puts an end to discourse itself. And um, the idea about this, as it becomes, becomes something in the city, is that unified action, or the decision to act together, that kind of coming together in that Martin Buber way, is something that is replaced by a notion of a process uh, which is more important than the plan that it makes. Very hard for us to think that way. We think about planning as you talk, you look at the alternatives, you make a decision, and then you do it. That's not dialogical. The dialogical thing is always a rolling self-edit of a plan. A plan is a proposition which is completely, uh, if you like, uh, subject to, to feedback. Um, in the World Bank, to just translate this into practical terms, we have come, or they, I have to say, they have come to understand that dialogical principles are ways to uh, avoid many of the top-down, rigid, and often disastrous decisions they took about uh, finance development. Um, uh, the people are trained in listening skills and learning to be silent in using non-combative language, and most of all, speaking in informally rather than always to the point. It creates messy and inefficient meetings, but they're also much more involving because of their very informality. And this is something that is, I think, built into any open system, that it's dialogical in focusing on, on self-correcting or self-revising processes rather than looking at, at discourse as a means to the end of action. The second aspect of an open city to me, economically, is its synchronicity, which simply means that many things are happening at once. This goes back to Aristotle. 
when Aristotle thought about uh, the synarchismos, what he was thinking about is that all these different oikai, these tribes, I guess you could call them, in Greek they're called tritis. I, anyhow, let's not go there. Um, uh, that they did different things. So his question was, how do you put together an economic activity in which some people are making pots, other people are making spears, in which some people are banking, and other people are um, uh, doing something, I don't know, very different medicine or something like that. The idea of synchronicity is that there is no coordination between these activities uh, of a superordinate kind. That is, they interact, but there's not an overarching principle that binds them together into one coherent form of activity. And for Aristotle, the notion was that the cracks that open up between these uncoordinated but related and interacting activities opens up the sphere of economic opportunity. So, you know, I started thinking about this. Um, you know, this isn't just about the ancient Greeks, you know that the way in which you get opening up a city economically is precisely by making those interstices where new things can be developed, where people can be entrepreneurial. Rather than doing the kind of, as the World Bank used to do, I, I don't mean to pick on them because I worked for them for a long time, but uh, as it used to do, which is to say that what you wanted was coherence in economic planning. That, for Aristotle, is the death of a city, you know? Um, so that is, um, for us, when, when we started thinking about economic, and Saskia particularly, about economic activity in modern cities, in the developing world today, we have to call them emerging cities, by the way, that's a polytest, is that how can we plan those ruptures? That is, how do we create incoherences economically that allow those interstices which open people up? And that goes back to the issue, Clay, that you and I were working on, which is informality, you know? But it's economic activity understood as informal in the sense that it's synchronous, which means that it's relatively uncoordinated. Um, OK, the, oh god, I'm talking too much. Uh, the third aspect of an open city is that the open city should be to the left of its nation state. In, in a way, this is perfectly in, in empirically obvious to all of you in the United States, which is, you know, large cities that are complex and have many elements, synchronous elements, are like New York and Boston, much more to the left than the, their nation states. We mean this in a more, um, I think in a more structural form which is that the work of legislating a nation state is essentially the work in most developing nation states of achieving closure on the informality of the city. That's the dynamic we were playing with. So that the nation state is, an, uh, in a way, the, its principles of political operation, constitutional as well as uh, dictator-centered, uh, dictator are things that close down this, this self-revising process simply by the formulation of laws that apply to all the conditions in the nation state. So what we were really arguing is that the Every open city 
is not so much socialist as anarcho-syndicalist. Syndicalist. That that's the opposition. That's the left we're interested in. That it's uh, of necessity, the more open it is, the more uh, it escapes the nation state's um, desire to create uh, order. I don't want to get lost in the relationship between Catalonia and uh, Spain, but <laughs> it's a perfect example of this. OK, well, this, these were then some of the principles that how we worked. We started backwards. We started with values, the t scientific committee for this year's Habitat, three. Uh, those values are the values of an open city. It's founded on something that's very fundamental, which is the idea of synoikismos. The values are more Levinasian than they are um, um, uh, Buberian. The, technically, those values translate into the ideas of an open system. And that an open system, such as you can see it in technical practice, um, translates into a city as an open system via the principles of dialogicalism, uh, synchronicity, and anarcho-syndicalism. So that's where we were now. I have to say that there were several people who took smelling salts when we presented this at various points. But um, I, I'm, now I'm going to start to just show you some slides about what we were thinking about about this. Hello. Go. There we are. Um, this is, you have to forgive me, I, I started photographing on an uh, iPhone, and I understand just when it ever gets blown up, the limits of using it. This is Nehru Place in Delhi, and this is the Silicon Alley of Delhi. There beneath the, the plafond, the ground here, is a parking garage. The uh, things you see on the side are startup centers, little startup centers. This is a place of lots and lots of different kinds of activities happening at the same time. Uh, people, uh, most of these are stolen goods that people are selling here. Uh, rip, you know, uh, iPhones that dropped off of a truck, things like that, intermixed with real things like saris and and, and so on. So the it. It conforms that kind of economic model. But the most important thing about it, to me, as an urbanist looking at it, is the porosity between the wall and the plafond, the, between the enclosed space and the open public space. The people working in here, some of them, they shop here. Many of the people who are selling stolen goods here are receiving them here. As an innovation center, Nehru Place is stimulating to people because it's not just about uh, uh, innovators living together in a bubble, but it's part of a very complex city. This is in the southeast part of Nehru Place. The reason we were here is we want to protect this place against development. And uh, every developer in, in Delhi has their eyes on this you know, get rid of all these people, uh, rip down this, and build a high rise. So the, the open principle here is that there's porosity in function and in form, and that uh, the character of the space is informal. Just so you understand that this is not something, as it were, third world, I hate that word, uh, something similar operates in McDougal Street. Oof, um, this uh, is stuff going to a lumber yard over here. These are yuppie spaces on McDougal Street. And above them are old um, uh, Italian tenements 
mixed in in this part of McDougal Street with light manufacturing. So, you know, this is, in my city, this is, this, this is a kind of analog of that. And the parts mix in with each other. I talked about the relationship of learning an open, that an open city takes skill. And uh, this is Slum and Dharavi. Uh, it's, uh, again, very mixed. The reason I show it to you is this. Over here is a school. I don't know if any of you know anything about Indian trains, but Indian trains are not what we think of as the most reliable on time. So the kids who live here have got to learn a kind of street smarts about getting here in a very basic way, listening hard to the sound of a train that may be there. Sometimes they'll, if, they're, if they can't escape the train, they have to learn how to hop onto it. Uh, the trains are extremely noisy, so the lessons in the school are sort of geared to when the train doesn't wipe out the, um, the voices of the teachers or pupils. That's street smarts in an open environment. And one of the things that impressed me in Medellin, uh, where I also worked quite a lot, is that how, how uh, sensorily adept uh, and, uh, kids are in dealing with unforeseen or unchanging conditions here. Much more so, I would hazard, than kids in a uh, bourgeois state in uh, a city like uh, London or, or New York. They're constantly having to revise the knowledge they have of an environment which itself is very unstable. This unfortunately has, bec has been at times the scene of Muslim-Hindu conflict and uh, sometimes quite violent. And the children again have to learn how to navigate around the, there are outbreaks of violence all the time, and the children have to learn to navigate that kind of social danger just the way they do physical danger. So that's what I mean by a kind of role, and they get better and better at it, a rolling kind of dialogical skill. This is, just so you see it in Dharavi, it's another one of these terrible iPhone photos. But what you see here is that the mixture of, you know, this is a production site, food selling site, people live up here and they also work up here. And this kind of gradation means that the space itself is, is experienced as many things rather than monofunctional. And I should say about monofunctional spaces, that's one of them in the back. I'm really sorry about my photograph. It's only a space for uh, residents. This is, this is funded by the IMF, this project. It's uh, uh, housing. It has flush toilets, et, et cetera, et cetera. It's decayed in about the five or seven years since it's been up, because it's like a monoculture. Only one thing happens there. People don't really take ownership over it the way they do about this space, which they have to make work because so, it's so complicated. Whereas this space is just degraded. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, the stairwells are full of shit and piss, you know. People don't have a feeling that they belong here in the way that they do down here. Okay, this is a kind of Closed city. I take this as um, uh, I, well. There's a lot to say about this, but uh, it is the the spaces are impermeable, as you can see, and they're very repetitive. And the reason I show this is that the derivative of this. This is the most fundamental image of modern planning. You need to know. 
This is a proposal of Corbusier to destroy a complex fabric in the Marais and to replace it by a closed system, which is boundaryless and homogenous. It's additive in, if, if you know, cl open sys sys closed systems theory, that things always add, the parts are, are not greater than, the whole is not greater than the sum of the parts. And Corbu wanted to, this is from 1925, he wanted to extend it over all the Marais and did all of Paris. The buildings themselves are quite beautiful. Um, so this is, I just choose, this is where I grew up, in, right here. Uh, this is Robert Taylor Holmes in Chicago. It was applied by liberal planning as a way of housing mass numbers of people in similar structures, which are relationship, relationless. They're just additive structures. Uh, and this is another version of the Plan Voisin. These, the, inf the interior, the, uh, the shells w within the sheaths of all of these skyscrapers in t Tokyo are the, exactly the same. And much of the skyscraper, this is a photograph of Thomas Strutt, my friend Thomas Strutt. It's, you look at it and you think this is diversity in the urban environment. In fact, it's exactly the idea of the plan voisin, but disguised. And this is, this is, I would really say, the enemy of what, in thinking about an open city, this is the enemy of this, which is this kind of disguised homogeneity. That's, and that was a very, for us, very practical thing. I'm going to go faster. Uh, we did a lot of work on smart cities, and uh, here is another aspect of uh, any closed system, that there's a tight fit between form and function, we looked at this in Mazdar. This is a docking station designed for the Mazdar car. But unfor and this was done by my friend Bill Mitchell and Frank Gehry designed this car. Unfortunately, after they worked on this car, uh, others came along and improved it, which meant that the cars no longer fit in the docking stations, which have been torn down. So this is also an issue about open-ended design in, in, a, um, in a, an open system, which is that you avoid a tight fit with form, form and function, which is always a recipe for technological obsolescence. Always. But this is... Now, I'm going to speak to you very quickly about... Um, what we try to, I, I'm gonna, well, I just let me say this. I'm so long-winded. Um, you know that the fortunes of high tech offer a key to understanding how the city is closed. But uh, we are now, uh, high tech is, uh, has moved from an open to a closed condition. Monopoly capitalism, restriction of uh, participation in actually the form, formation of, of programs, open source, the menu rather than the kernel dominates, dominate, dominates. And that's true in cities as well. There's a loss of synchronicity, uh, there's kind of standardization, uh, uh, there's much less local experiment economically. And there's uh, an erosion of the powers of municipalities at the hands of nation states, which is a really big issue in the developing world. I'm not going to talk about this um, because I've talked too much. So I just wanted to end this, this presentation by saying, what can design do to open up the city? That was, the, that was our practical problematic. I am not a design determinist. I don't think that 
any, anything you learn in this building will change capitalism, you know? But that's a wrong way to think about it, you know, that um, the idea is what if you could get the, the economic and political instruments to uh, contest Google and Microsoft, what would you do in, the, in their place, you know? And the, um, we were talking about this last week in, in class. If you believe that design uh, is a kind of leading edge against capitalism, basically, well, let's not get into it anyhow. But that's the idea. What can design do about this? We singled out three things that you'll see in this technical reports. Edge conditions, incomplete form, and arbitrary markings of value is something design can do. You know that the, in the natural world, there's a distinction on the edge condition between ecological borders and ecological boundaries. Very important condition. Uh, an ecological border is something where at the edge, there's more intense activity between different groups, okay? That's true of the way when the shore hits the land, that's where organisms feed, it's where the speed of evolution is strongest in species and so on. This which is uh, drawn by one of my students and my, my favorite image in this whole thing are uh, tiger boundaries uh, drawn in Asia and they represent, you know how a tiger makes a boundary, it poops, and, and you, you know, it tells you don't go cross that. And these are pr pretty rigid and pretty solid boundaries between the yellow and the red and so on. But the notion is that at a boundary, there's less activity, right? So that's, that's the two conditions, edge conditions. One, which the edge intensifies activity, which is a border, and the boundary in which the edge condition dispels it. Now, we're interested in making more boundaries and less, more borders and less boundaries in the city. And we're inspired by this, not simply uh, by the present day conditions, but by the example of Noli's map of, of Rome, which is a map of all sorts of but if you look at the little things here, they're all about permeable public spaces. That's what all these little markings are. This is not a figured ground. This is a much more sophisticated map in which Noli tried to draw what is impermeable and what is permeable, St. Peter's, as you know. And uh, so all of this and so on. And we were interested we are inspired by this to look at this. This is an urban boundary, Caracas. We're trying to work at it. You can see what the boundary is made of. It's made of traffic. The only way to cross from here to here is this one bridge. Maids cross from here to clean these houses. Nobody from this middle class thing crosses into uh, the, the barrio. This was done under uh, the sainted socialist regime of Venezuela, this, this one. And this is ubiquitous throughout the emerging cities. Okay, the second thing we were interested in was incomplete form. You all know Aravena's Iquique, right? Which is a, a form made incomplete in order to be filled in before and after. And the idea of this, which is rather persuasive, although I, I don't like the actual architecture of it, the idea of persuasive is it's better to make half of a good house than to make a complete cruddy house. So these are, these are economically very good houses. I, 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 I adore him, but I just, I have so many problems about this, anyhow. Uh, but, uh, that's a result. This is, you know, it's sweat equity and it works. Uh, we were interested in a different condition, which is incomplete form is something that's found in the city rather than made from the start. 
And the reason for that is something that you may not know if you don't know third world cities. They're not built, the spread in them is not built just on empty agricultural land. There are abandoned spaces that are filled in for housing. There are places which, uh, as in, we see in, a lot in China, in which there are you know, disused things like factories and so on, which could be recolonized. And, um, and uh, the idea that, that development occurs on, in a, a kind of blank slate it's really wrong. It, a lot of development occurs through uh, colonizing uh, forms that were incomplete. I worked on this project, and this has been always a guide to me. This is the Riverside Viaduct at 125th Street in New York. Do you know it? Yeah. Well, the West Side Highway, oops, the West Side Highway is above it. And this was originally just left by, in the, Moses, in the Moses era, this was just left below this. This is the west edge of Harlem. And we put the first fairway supermarket, we just inserted it below the highway. It was the first time that blacks and whites had a supermarket in West Harlem. And they met there. And it was, you know, it was a kind of racial co-presence, which fit into the kind of social relations I've been describing to you. But the point about this is everywhere in cities, there are places like this, which are spaces which are incomplete forms which are found. And our argument in, the key, in, in Habitat 3 is that these are the spaces we want to develop. We want to do this kind of stuff rather than draw on blank sheets of paper. And that's a big issue, I would say, for people doing elements here, which is the tendency is always to treat the city as a kind of tabula rasa, which loses out exactly on the possibilities for doing this kind of stuff. The third thing we did, and I'll just end with here, is we were very interested in the ways of arbitrarily marking spatial value, to make a value where nobody saw value in space. The prototype for this, the classic way to do it, is a Piazza del Popolo in uh, this is Sixtus V. You use this uh, obelisk as a way of saying, Come here, this is, this is not just an empty space at the end of a bunch of roads. It has a value. Uh, the issue for us was a relation between context and non-context in ways of marking space. This is a very context-specific uh, marker. Uh, the frame here determines the form of these markers, which mark this is a place of importance. We were much more interested in this, in the uses of arbitrary markers to make value where there is no value. This young boy is tending, the, this is in Medellin, where I work a lot, as I said. It's just put, he bought a plant and he planted it. And it's a way of marking that space as something other than it's blasted out because there's been a lot of violence, drug violence here, of just saying this is habitable. And what we have been thinking about is ways of doing this. I'm going to show you the, the design issue of this. This in Berlin is a context-specific intervention of a bench. It could only be there because of the steps where this is an arbitrary imposition. This is actually, these benches are uh, imposed in one of the most degraded streets in East Berlin. And they make value. And one of the things that we have been thinking about in, um, uh, in the work we've been doing, uh, particularly in uh, working with decayed environments, 
is how to create a system of these arbitrary markers that mark that this place matters to someone. Uh, these people have never seen a bench here. You know, this is, I don't know if any of you know, parts of East Berlin are disgusting. You know, they were, they're just, they're decaying. People don't, the street, you can see all of this. But these very simple kind of I interventions are creating value for people. And I have to say that they are also, it's part and parcel if, on an analytic level of what happens in uh, a, an open system. That there are what are called arbitrary intrusions, which change the, the path of development. You know, that's when you get path dependency through what are called arbitrary intrusions. If you use the Linux system, you will, if you, if you can, I can barely program in it, but if you're good at programming in it, you can introduce these all the time. This is the urban analog to changing the path of what something looks like through an arbitrary thing. So this has translated, we're spending a lot more money in both the IMF and the World Bank on th things that are looked at as uh, gigaws instead of buildings on street furniture, on landscaping, you know, on things that arbitrarily raise the value of places. So I hope this gives you an idea of, of what I been up to. As I say, I don't think I'll live to Habitat for Maybe I'll make it to 90, I don't know. But um, for us, the, uh, these are the, all that we're thinking about. But these give you an eye flavor, working uh, to open up edges as borders, um, to work with incomplete forms as found opportunities, and to impose arbitrarily value of transforming the city by design into an open system. So that's what I have to say. Tell me where we went wrong. It's only 20 years of work, so. Uh. Well, I'll start with a question. Yeah. While you guys are getting your questions together. So I actually have two maybe related questions. First of all, thank you very much. I always love hearing you draw on your great soci urban sociological Gemeinschaft, Gesellschaft, your tradition, trying to understand how people interact in spaces. Your implicit, if not explicit, critique of modernism in kind of thinking yeah. about the open city. So I guess my first question has to do with, um, I mean, the general question is how would you get, oh, how would you get citizens and the state? And I can, we can talk about the local state now, not even the national yeah. government. You made a point about kind of the left and the national state to value the open city that you are producing, because I can see in a room full of designers how we love what you're talking about. And, you know, kind of the serendipity and the beauty of kind of mixed use and spontaneity and serendipity, things you've all written about. But there is, it's, I, I, as somebody who works in the developing world, you can, you can imagine a conversation with bureaucratic officials and even some like middle class citizens who do not want to, do not appreciate the romanticization of informality, for example, that you've shown of Mumbai. And that we may hate Corbu and these big high rises, but a lot of people want to live there. And a lot of real estate developers want to build those things. And a lot of local, local governments are looking for mass produced housing for their citizens. Right. So, um, and just let me add that I'm working with students here. I've done some work in Mexico. We're in a city in Aramosillo. I hope some of you are here. But like you oh, get really? citizens that want to have single family homes out in the middle of nowhere. They don't want to be interacting in places that look like Mumbai and the oh, Ravi, etc. So, how do we take these wonderful ideas that you're talking about that we as designers and planners might be thinking about, and how do we promote and change the way people have come to think about cities now? Well, it's a wonderful question. One of the volumes in the report of Habitat 3 is about co production. 
And our answer to getting people involved in working this way is by a whole set of, and this, my new book, so cheap, and it'll come out April 11th. You guys, uh, 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 has a lot about co-production as a way of involving people in the process of wanting to make places more open rather than closed. I'm going to just give you one example of this that we've been working on. Co-production is not the same as consultation. Consultation is an, uh, an expert getting up and saying, this is, this is what you should do, isn't it beautiful? And people say, no, that's not what I want. We've worked with all sorts of techniques where uh, you know, skilled designers like me and ordinary citizens work on actually generating alternative forms for a particular project. Uh, uh, some of it, is, it may seem trivial to you, the use of big scale styrofoam blocks, which people can move around and experiment with, is really involving to people. We've got a whole set of techniques about, we, we, we've made catalogs of parts that would put Rem Koolhaas to shame, that people sort of flip through their, their coffee table objects in, in uh, Rio and so on. But the point about this, my experience with this, is that the more you involve expert and citizens together from the beginning in co-production, the more people are open to, to being open, and the less what they want to do is build a gated community because they're involved in the design process from the beginning. The one... Uh, limit on all of this, and again, this is just my own experience in working with poor communities. At a certain point, the expert disappears. You, if you make three or four alternatives, just the same thing we do in the GSD, you make three or four alternatives of a project, you know, people can look at it, they understand the pluses and minuses of each, and then the so-called expert says goodbye. And people themselves have to decide what they want to do. When I, I worked in Beirut in the late, in mid and late 90s on reconstruction of part of Beirut with that, that horrible terrorist Hezbollah. Let's not go there. Uh, and there, between Hezbollah and uh, a lot of the Falange, uh, uh, parts of South Beirut were a mess. But if you laid out to people three or four ways, worked with them, ways of even using a scarce resource like copper wire, and as you've got to decide. In conditions like that, you got people say, well, they're gone, you know. I claim my mother had gotten ill or something like that. I had some excuse. And these two groups, they hated each other, but they worked together to, to come to a decision. But much more broadly, I just think that the answer to opening the city, it's more democracy of, of design, not a better design. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not the right design that involves people in the city. It's the notion that they made whatever is there, even if it's so simple as distributing copper wire uh, for uh, a copy of tubing, excuse, excuse me, for, uh, for plumbing. Yeah, so you're calling for participatory design, which I think we're going trying to do more here. I'm not going to start a dialogue here, and I totally agree with you, but like, and then we start thinking about what are the institutions that are available to us to kind of suggest and the scale at which that happens. I do think, I guess I'm agreeing with you and saying that we need to be working more on like, not just the being compelled by the idea, but how do we implement it in practice? This is a part of the dilemma that we're constantly facing in planning and design, which is how do you get the designers to take processes and, and kind of repertoires of action that are in planning? It's not just that we can't agree that that's important, but then how do you change um, larger planning institutions at the scale of the city to engage to participatory down, design? Yeah. So, I, but I, I wish it. Uh, 
Hi, thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to work with one of the communities that you chose. In oh, the, great. Which one? Uh, Caracas, with the oh, barrio, with the informal settlement. And uh, in a process of participatory design, yeah. uh, at that opportunity, I had, I had read your theory about bonder, uh, borders and boundaries. I really wanted to uh, improve more connection between different communities. Because as you know, this settlement, this informal settlement is not only one community. Yeah, it's, it's a many. Sum, it's some sum of many small communities. But at the same time, they live the good experience of interaction. They suffer, the community suffer yeah. the uh, problems of lack of rules, of, uh, of norms that to work yeah. together, to live together. So in that opportunity, I proposed many options, and the community chose the ones that promote mm -hmm. an enclave. That's just the way the, it should the be. The community, because they want to protect themselves from the ah. violence of the environment. So yeah. how can we deal if we know, as technicians, that uh, the community is, is choosing uh, what we think is, a, is not a good option for them? Um, well, in that community, that's a very, that's a very drug, uh, am I remembering that right? No, it's not. Um, I think that's something about talk. You know, that's where this dialogical thing comes in. The more you can get people to talk with each other. This is just my own, you know, experience with it. If you say, what do you want to people, they say safety, you know, protection, close, close the, lock the doors, and so on. If you get people from different communities to talk to each other, that process can open up. And oftentimes, that talk is not goal oriented. You know, that's where the informality of this comes comes in. This is not a magic bullet, open city. I said that at the beginning, I just emphasized that. But it is a way of thinking about how you want to guide the kind of action you have. If you don't want people to close up, you have to get them to interact in ways where they're not focused on the other as a threat. Do you know what I mean? So that's, and that's dialogical. You know, it's non-aggressive, non-assertive uh, ways of thinking. So that's, uh, that, as I remember, that's quite a, it, that's from uh, villages all over Venezuela, isn't it? That uh, barrio. The name? Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow. Hello. Um, over here. <laughs> I don't see you. Oh, Raise your hand. Down uh, in the first row. <laughs> oh, there you are. Yes. Uh, Thanks for the lecture. Um, I was wondering, uh, you mentioned how design can't change capitalism, but I'm wondering how design can like dismantle it or transform it. Uh, Isn't that what, the same thing? Well, no, because then it's, it's saying we're not changing the principles of capitalism, we're not changing how it works, we're actually just using a different system. Uh, you could do that, but it would be on a very small scale. Uh, I think there's a kind of... Now, I'm giving you a serious answer to this. I think the notion that you create an ELO, you know, a, a protected realm, where you're working with a different set of, of assumptions, can be valuable, but you're never going to uh, achieve a scale that way. There's something that, you know, politics requires politics. Uh, I don't think design, for instance, if I wanted to stop gentrification in New York, I know exactly what I'd do. I'd institute commercial rent controls. It, it would work a treat. Uh, but it has nothing to do with what any of those stores look like. It's, it's economic power against economic power. And uh, it's, I, I just think for, uh, for you as a designer, if you think, how can I avoid this system 
by making a better design. It's it's too uh, it, it, it's too small and it's it's too in a way unreal. I mean, what we do as designers is something, it's very partial, it's very important. It's very important to think what should be. But the power of what should be is limited. Um, and I mean, you understand the point I'm making. If you, you've got to fight capitalism with socialism, period. You know, you're not going to fight it with uh, uh, lowering the uh, uh, with lowering the building heights. Do you know what I mean? There is a kind of way in which you have to enter into the adult world of of dirty power and uh, recognize that you're you're partially going to be imprisoned by that and demeaned by it, but not simply to think that, oh, it's useless to do anything by that. Now, I don't know, this is, you know, I've suffered this all my life. I'm a good socialist, uh, you know. Uh, but it's in a somewhat different compartment from me, from my eye. The way that we design involves the economic systems and the it political does. systems in place. So inherently, all design is political in that way. Absolutely. So I guess I'm wondering, like... What I'm as, talking about yeah. is the power of what you make. Mm -hmm. You can get a vision of something that's different, but you can't, as I say, uh, the vision of something that's different is not going to be empowering mm -hmm. in a way that political or economic activity is empowering. Uh, this is just my own view of, of, of this. What I, uh, and I, I tell you why I feel this, because so often when, uh, this is a discussion I have with Jane Jacobs all the time, that so often when we're fighting power uh, and we lose, you know, we give up because the things we want to build are just overwhelmed. And uh, just to say about her, I mean, the thing about Jane is after she wrote um, Economy of Cities, she sort of lost interest in design because she saw it was a mugs, you know, it's, it wasn't going to change. She, was, she wasn't going to, she could resist Robert Moses, but she couldn't erase him. Do you know what I mean? And she became uninterested in urbanism. She, her, she had wonderful, wonderful writings, but it was a kind of defeatism. And um, I, I just, I don't think that's the trajectory you want, you want to, to go in. Can I get in here for a second? And then I, we have one buddy, somebody here with a hand and also. We have one up in the balcony too. Oh, okay. Yeah, great. Okay. I just want to respond to this exchange a little bit and okay, maybe I'm add what I would have heard you, what I thought I'm, what you were going to say, Richard, about the issue about design and capitalism. So, you know, in total agreement that kind of the building heights and how you kind of, the f thinking in a very narrow sense of physical design obviously is not going to dismantle capitalism. It's, but that doesn't necessarily mean that one has to kind of, say that all design reinforces capitalism, right? And I think what's missing in this, um, that conversation is the focus on, well, the focus on the fact that to dismantle capitalism is a social and a political project, as Richard has said, social as well as a political project, which means people have to be involved and they have to mobilize and they have to do the work of fighting <coughs> against capitalism. And this is where I think the design comes in. It's quite consistent of what you were saying about open cities. How do you create cities that uh, bring people together to mobilize? So there is a design dimension to it, but there's not a direct relationship 
relationship between design and the dismantling of capitalism is how does design create the urban conditions, the solidarity, the, the, the sets of values, the conversation, the normative project that would be necessary in order to fight against capitalism. So I don't think it's out of the picture completely, but it's really important not to assume any direct relationship between design and the support for or dismantling of capitalism. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Go. Okay. Um, hi, thank you. Here, um, I um, first I want to say I am actually from Beijing, and it's actually quite sad every time people mention um, about a Chinese city, they always show that those pictures yeah. of high-rise, gated um, tower community. Uh, where I want, I actually want to say, I think in Chinese culture, it's. Um, if you look at the ground level, as sometimes you build very, um, as you would put it, like very enclosed, uh, closed urban space, but people somehow always try to find a way to permit that um, closed uh, structure and then figure out a way to, you know, on the ground level to interact with each other. And as you were showing all these um, wonderful examples, um, I was just wondering, um, out of all these countries you've worked with, um, do you found do you find this idea of creating a more open um, city a universal concept that um, should be adopted by every culture, or is there some excep exceptions that you've met where people do not want this kind of open space? And and as planners, I guess um, it's also um, what um, should we prioritize this as our idea of planning, or should we? You know, sometimes you know there are ideas um, that we always promote, like DOT and then like shared bike and all that. But sometimes that's not community's um, top priority, right? It's like these little wonderful designs on the street level to create a more open space. Mm -hmm. How much should we as planners prioritize these? Well, you've asked me. Uh, you made a comment and asked me a question, and uh, the comment is. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is, those buildings can be used by people who want to have life on the ground. We're involved, uh, uh, UNDP is involved in trying to so solve as many of the hutong structures in Beijing as we can, also the Shikamen in, in uh, Shanghai as structures, as places for people to practice that kind of life. I'd say it's just harder when you're dealing with a 46-story building. Yeah, you know, it's just harder to hold on to that. The question you asked me, I'm going to answer in a way which may seem outrageous. I think you should universalize every value you have. I don't think you should be culture specific. Let people argue with you and say, but that doesn't work here. We don't want that. Don't be nice. Oh, I understand your way of life. You, you want to live in a gated community and never see a black person. I understand you're Southern American. I sympathize. No, not at all. And I think part of the whole job of planning is to say, this is what you should want. Argue with people. Be dialogical with them. Rather than substitute empathy for will. You know, that's my own view of this. And I have to say, I mean, I'm a, a nice guy, but you know, I, am, I, I practice what I preach. When you say to people, you're all wrong. You know, you want the wrong things. They take that more seriously than if you say, oh, God, poor you, you know? This is true. It's an experience in this country with white working class people, for instance. If you go, oh, there's such victims, there's such suffering. I understand why they voted for Trump. No. No, the answer is to say, you did something wrong. And that is a way of taking the other person seriously as a person. So I, I, I just don't buy this notion of communal sensitivity. I don't buy it at all. I think you should be a provocateur. 
Um, it's really terrific to hear somebody actually like say something firm. Uh, so I had a, I was formulating a moment ago um, a rather rough question, but I wanted to um, precedent it with a, a rather sentimental um, uh, anecdote, which is the 125th Street exit on the off of the West uh, Hudson Parkway. Every time I come into New York to visit a friend of mine in Harlem, that Safeway is an amazing indicator that I am now in a city. Ah, oh, my boy. <laughs> so I, I'm very, very oh. happy to see it. So now for the more difficult question. Um, you've, you've obliquely actually, or actually even directly kind of confronted this, but the, 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 the procedures and processes of designs, I think, work insofar as the, uh, uh, the, the power brokers, more specifically the actors that have agency in yeah. the situation, really even want to entertain the conversation. Uh, and I think that in a neighborhood like Caracas, you have this density and um, you know overlaying of of people that you almost kind of have a milieu where you can at least have publicity of your of your cause. But in let's say these white working class neighborhoods in the United States, or I'd say more specifically in the uh, underserved neighborhoods of the caricatured inner cities in the United States, the power brokers who would have you know, the ability to reshape and provide the services or to provide the resources to enable those communities are absent, uh, disengaged, and absolutely not going right. to entertain a big city liberal coming in to save the day. So I'm absolutely with you on the design strategy front, and I'm absolutely with you on the argument um, that politics is the situation. But how do you, how do you actually engage to make audience the issues of, of, of what you're describing, especially contextual to the United States, I think? Well, um, it's a really good question. I'll I just give you a couple answers I've found about this. Um, one of the things that I've recommended when I've done community organizing is that people not go to community consultations, that uh, they don't play the game of listening to somebody tell them what's going to be done for them. Uh, and this is a strategy not unique to me. It, it comes from Saul Alinsky about the notion of what power needs is an audience. And if that audience is absent, there's a lot of delegitimation that goes on in power. So you know, when we were working in Chicago, uh, Cabrini Green, uh, the, the notion was that we boycotted the official, uh, you know, the official workings of this. You need somebody from the outside who is going to be an alternative source of power often. And in working with emerging cities, that's a role that UNDP now and UN Habitat are trying to play, that they are, as it were, at the local level, that alternative voice to this articulation of power. It's a really complicated issue for us because the UN is caught in all these cross currents. But what I know about this is that the way to start with this is by delegitimating the, the settings and institutions in which power gets itself ratified. And that means a totally different relationship to things like planning boards, you know. Uh, when we worked in, um, in uh, working in Dharavi, we are encouraging people to vote on Blanco. Do you know what that is? To, to turn in blank uh, 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 ballots. To say that the process is not legitimate. So it's a whole different set of tools. Is it successful? Sometimes. And sometimes it isn't. But it, it's least understanding that the point of this is to start by delegitimating the process by which power ratifies itself through all these planning instruments, you know. And uh, do, you, do you all know the name of Saul Alinsky? Is this somebody familiar to you all? Citizens Action 
action program. Citizens Action Program, Back of the Yards Program. He was, uh, he was once here, by the way, and stayed for 20 minutes <laughs> and just said, it's not worth it. <laughs> so, uh, that's the old GSD. That's the old GSD, absolutely. We have yeah, we have one more question and then I, I, I yeah. Thank you. Um, I wanted to extend a little bit the point that Diane brought up about institutions um, uh, who could champion and uh, advocate uh, for the things you're talking about, the sort of exchange, the serendipity, um, the uh, unplanned encounter and, and uh, good things that happen in open urban environments. If we think about the actual um, practice of real estate development, urban design, um, and architecture, then the owners of properties behind private property lines have very clear motives um, to whether it's profit-driven motives or other self-interested yeah. motives in, in, in championing their cause. The public space, on the other hand, is generally owned by um, the public or by the should municipality. Be, yeah. It should be, right? And it, they oftentimes don't have the same level of advocacy or interest in advocating for the things you talk about. And if you simply think into, look into, for instance, urban design practice, all urban designers know that there's very little money in urban design. All the money is in the buildings um, where right. sort of after doing the urban design, they hope to get commissioned a few buildings out of it to pay the bill that went lost yeah. in the urban. So I'm, I guess my question is, do you have, um, have you encountered or do you have institutions and cities as examples where that has been kind of managed and figured out in better ways in which you can really put resources behind um, the management and design of public space in a very serious way to kind of champion the values you're talking about. I examples like just what comes to mind, for instance, that Vienna has a planning department composed of 300 people for the size of Vienna, and it has really great, um, uh, it does well, really great work, yeah. right? But what, what sort of uh, well, examples? Well, I, I, give you, I, I give you one example that w we're working, the mayor of Bogota, uh, Enrique Penalosa, has he ever spoken here? Yeah, he has. Uh, uh, He's also part of the scientific committee. Uh, has pointed out that the greatest privatization of public space is parking. And the strategies in his paper for t uh, taking back the public and public space is largely to uh, shrink streets and eliminate uh, street parking. Very banal in a way, but also very, very profound which is the notion that we have to, I, and I'm convinced by him on this, rethink the notion of motion in the city in order to re public, uh, re, uh, to take back this public, public space. And that goes back in the history of urbanism to Hausmann, you know, who was against parking, you know. Um, uh, and what happened, you know, with the automobile and so on. The larger question, and that, that is an example of trying, and he's trying to do it. And he's been very successful in Bogota uh, his first two times around as mayor in, in recapturing that public space. There is another issue in this, uh, we just don't have time to talk about it, which is that, you know, there are two ways in which people invest foreign investors invest in cities at a distance. One is opportunity investing, where you're focused on a missed opportunity or lack of money uh, to develop a particular site. And the other is core investing, which is where you're basically buying specifications, you know, materials and so on, and then you're building a building to suit in some place. It's completely non-context dependent. And what's happening in the economy of a lot of developing cities is there is a shift from core investing, which requires local, uh, from opportunity investing, which requires local knowledge, to core investing, in which the process of development is like a monetary exchange based on specs. So one of our um, recommendations is that core investors, if they're going to do that, be required to see a building through 
to its actual completion. Because a lot of core investing then flips, you know. I buy a project and I sell it on to somebody else, I sell it right or, you know, uh, something like that. That's a way of at least holding private capital responsible for delivering something. It's minimal, you know. But it is a halfway step, and some countries will do this, I think. I think Great Britain is actually going to do this, in which you hold an investor responsible to the public for actually uh, trying to make a profit out of a public good, which is land. You know? Anyhow, this is an incredibly long discussion. Thank you for being so patient. A huge round of applause to you. I just want to summarize some ideas just because I'm so happy you gave this lecture, Richard, because this is a very rich conversation that I hope we can continue. Is this on? No. <laughs> no. Uh, that we can continue here at the school, but I just want to pull out some summary points and then we're going to have a huge round of applause for you. One, again, just in picking up on your last comment, I just think that this is a super self-serving comment, but I just think that what we're starting to talk about here is a way in which design and planning are all about politics and power, and how do you make decisions about who do you engage with that larger project. It's not about, the, it's so easy to think about the discipline of planning, the discipline of urban design as if they float around the you know, yeah. float around, and that it's really about if you want to change the the physical and social world in which we live in for other objectives, it's really about engaging in those institutions and being strategic in those arrangements. The second comment that I'd like to pull up that I think came through in your answers to multiple questions, and I'm even thinking about the fellow upstairs with like the United States. I think that. One thing that I learned being in the planning side of our department from urban designers is the importance of thinking um, strategically about where to intervene. And you yeah. brought it up with the kind of, of liminal space that you're looking at. But we could take that, that framework, that analytic, not just to different places to be exploring and discovering dis different places in a neighborhood or in a city for intervention that might have the greatest capacity to kind of shake up things. But we should be thinking about cities that way. In particular, we should be, as students here, we should be honing our analytical skills to understand different, the character and the nature, physical and social, of different types of cities, large cities versus small cities, southern cities of Trump voters versus New York City. And that in some ways that you can be strategic about intervening in those places and creating projects in those places that will change the social conversation. And that's what's going to kind of work up. We tend to not we tend to focus our attention maybe on the skills that we're getting, the design skills and the planning skills, process and, and kind of building design, but we're not thinking about the places that we should be applying those projects more. If you care about changing politics or dismantling capitalism, that's the analytic you need, not just the skill set itself. And I guess it's a call out for focusing more on the specificity of places, knowing the deep culture history uh, institutions of places, many different places, and then being strategic about where you want to apply your skills. Rather than just always, everybody's always working in New York City, everybody's always working in the places that, that are most close to the project that we are trying to achieve, as opposed to going to the tough places to be urban planners and designers. And I just think all that came through in your, in oh. both in your talk and in the engagement with the students. So thank you so much, Richard. Well, thank you for asking me.